Any questions on threads on lab two or lab three? Uh, Nancy, we get it started. Okay, for lab three, uh, in the this pipe thing, we couldn't do like FDS one, FDS zero. We had to do like pointer FDS plus one and pointer FDS. Uh, so when you say you couldn't do yeah. this, what do you mean you couldn't do it? Like the compiler complained and it was like red. Uh, so your FDS is a pointer to an integer. Yeah. This is literally just... Yeah, this works. So I'd be curious to see. Okay. There, must be, there must be something very bad. The, the type of the variable. Okay. Other questions? So, uh, something that's come up a number of times, I think there was a, uh, I posted something on Slack about it, but just to make sure we're all on the same page, uh, OSB expects that uh, that processes that call spawn to create a new process, there's the expectation that you're then able to wait for that spawn process to finish. What this implies is that Whatever you're doing in fork to make the newly created process a child of the current process, the same thing needs to happen when spawn is called. And by that I mean proc spawn. And sys spawn is the system call calls proc spawn. Because in order for a process to be able to wait on something, the thing it's waiting for needs to be its child, and therefore spawn needs to make the new process be, be a child as well. Otherwise, uh, if uh, we take a look at some of the uh, programs, we have the init process. This is the very first process that uh, the kernel creates using spawn that we look at main.c in kernel init. It calls proc spawn to create this initial process. And so this means that proc spawn can be called by something that's not a process. So the current process can be null for this very first init proc. And so that's something that you would need to, if you are trying to dereference the pointer to the current process, be aware that it can be null inside Proxpon. And so once this init process starts up, it starts the shell program, where it prints out the dollar sign and reads in your commands, and then it just waits for its children. And so this wait should block because there should be this shell process that the initial process is waiting for. Similarly, the shell, when it executes your command, it calls spawn and then waits for that specific child. So both of these things require that a process be able to wait on its spawn children in order to function correctly. Any questions on this? All right. C 
So today uh, we are continuing with uh, dealing with concurrency uh, in, uh, in a, con a multi-threaded system. And uh, we've seen kind of the, a couple basic building blocks of synchronizing uh, concurrent code. Uh, we've seen lots. And condition variables have uh, two, uh, two kind of fundamental concurrency or synchronization, synchronization primitives. So uh, before I get into the kind of new uh, tools for synchronization for today, uh, just as a bit of a uh, kind of review and to, uh, to think about what we've been learning about threads, uh, I'd like you to discuss with your neighbors whether Could a thread read or write local variables that are stored on another thread stack? Is this never possible, sometimes possible, always possible? Why or why not? So take a few minutes and discuss with your neighbors brainstorm about <coughs> Hearing hearing lots of good yeah. <laughs> discussion out there. Uh, is this uh, thoughts on never, sometimes, always? Sometimes. Why sometimes? Uh, in some contexts, uh, the stack of one thread is in a different. Is like the in most contexts, threads share the same address space. However, in many contexts, a thread would not have a natural way of finding an address in another thread stack. Yeah. So this is this is a great point that threads share an address space, meaning that they have the same set of virtual addresses, uh, and uh, likely the same set of memory permissions. Uh, when do threads share an address space? Do all threads everywhere share an address space? Battle? Only within the same process. So a process is a kind of unit in our system that has its own private address space. So if there are multiple threads that are part of the same process, they all share the same address space. So that picture I drew the other day, where within this address space there were kind of multiple of the thread stacks, that was multiple threads within the same process. And so even though they ostensibly have their own local variables. The operating system is not preventing one thread from just going and reading or writing uh, the stack of another. Uh, it's because the threads within a process are assumed to be kind of cooperating parts of the same program. So we don't need to do a bunch of extra work to protect them from each other. Will makes a good point. This reading and writing the local variables of another stack would require that you, you had the memory address of those things, or that you just tried some memory address that happened by on purpose or by accident that happened to be in another thread stack. So, so is there no protection whatsoever that the OS implements to make sure that threads aren't overwriting each other? Besides just like, oh, we'll have them far apart. Uh, yeah, so if the threads are part of the same process, it's like you are all part of one program. You all share memory, 
you can use that to cooperate however you see fit. So the operating system is uh, uh, kind of memory protection is implemented at the level of the process. And if we need that protection, we have separate processes. If we have multiple threads, we want them to be able to cooperate with shared memory. So I guess kind of related to that, didn't we say last time that there's a bit of memory protection when like the stack pointers themselves like start encroaching? Like you could access the memory if you just like guessed, but if your stack just expanded far enough, like it would shift to try and avoid that. Yes, we consider this situation where one thread stack grew so much it started to overlap another, and I think at that point the system would have to relocate, presumably the smaller of the two stacks to some other uh, set of virtual addresses. Um, uh, rather, I mean, so, yeah, they are contiguous chunks of virtual memory, which doesn't necessarily mean they're all in the same chunk of physical memory. Um, so it's really, we're worried about, well, what if the span of virtual addresses overlap? Um, and for that, maybe you make them far apart and say a thread stack can't be bigger than uh, 100 megabytes. And we're just going to not let it, and no thread should need, like if a thread is using that much space on its stack, it should be putting some of that stuff on the heap or something is going wrong. Other thoughts or questions about this situation? Is there like a maximum of threads you can make? Like what if you try to make like a million threads? Can you, like... uh, so this is, um, this gets to uh, the kind of user threads versus kernel threads uh, that we were talking about last time. You try and make a million kernel threads. Each of those threads, even though it's less overhead than a process, so like a system call and, and yeah. kernel resources, uh, and so that's going to likely be very bad for performance. Uh, and maybe the OS would enforce some of it, or perhaps not. In the kind of standard uh, thread library, uh, in Linux, as well as in Java, when it creates threads, uh, it makes a kernel thread for each user thread. There's like a one-to-one, -one, like a user thread is basically a wrapper around the kernel thread. And so in those situations, also, you're trying to create a million threads, you're going to grind the system to a halt. It's just too much, uh, which is one reason why, uh, in a number of situations, you implement kind of exclusively user threads that don't require a bunch of work in the kernel, and then it's you have a lot, you can create a lot more of those threads than you can of these ones that create a kernel thread along with it. Other questions or comments? All right, so let's imagine a scenario. We have a library with 10 uh, identical study rooms. And these study rooms, there's no difference between them at all. They're just completely uh, interchangeable. And we have a system where students have to request uh, a room from like a front desk to get access to a pretty good study room. Uh, so, Students request and uh, if no room is free, the student is going to wait uh, until until someone checks out. Someone comes back to the front desk and says, "I'm done using the room I was in." Uh, which means that uh, when a student is done with the room, they have to go to the front desk and say, hey, I'm done with the room. So in a situation where uh, these study rooms are some shared resource on a computer system, and our student requests here are uh, threads that are requesting, I would like one of these 10 uh, available resources. Uh, could we kind of 
synchronize this uh, or control this access to resources using our mutual exclusion lock, using our, our standard lock that we, uh, that we have. Uh, is there a way for our, our lock to be used to say, can a student uh, get access to a room now? Uh, yes. Uh, okay. <laughs> uh, if you have a lock around some counter, for example, and that counter is only is locked whenever increments, whenever a thread is, you know, whenever a student is granted their request, and as long as that lock is, you know, as long as you lock, uh, fire the lock and check it, and then oh, it's got ten people I can't join, and they release the lock, and then yeah. So this that that's that's an important point that we want something like a lock plus some additional state, like some count of like how many people have acquired the lock almost. And then when someone releases it, we can let another person in. And so if we were, if we were limited to just a lock without this additional state, we're hampered by the fact that our lock only has two different states. It's either busy or free. Whereas this setup, we have 11 different states, all the way from zero rooms free to all 10 rooms free. And so this means that it might be nice to have some sort of synchronization object, some primitive, that incorporates some notion of state. That we kind of build some new object that is going to apply to situations where we need to keep track of, of how many uh, how many threads have we, we let in or, or something like that. Uh, and so this is exactly what the semaphore uh, the, the semaphore does. It's something that it has a current value uh, and this value is Initialize to some non-negative integer. So we're going to start out our semaphore with 0 or 2 or 5, 10. And we can do two things with our semaphore. We can say we can say semaphore wait and semaphore post. These are the names of the uh, standard Linux implementation of, of semaphores, same sort of style that OSV uses, where we have like convar wait and convar signal, semaphore wait, semaphore post. Uh, these do, uh, because semaphores have been around a long, a long time, uh, we have other names that these go by. They're kind of traditional names. Uh, would be um, that uh, weight is uh, can be called p. It comes from a, uh, a Dutch portmanteau that uh, Edgar Dijkstra came up with. Uh, is the, the original creator uh, a, a, a Dutch computer scientist creator of the semaphore? So we have p. And B, which are these uh, come from, from Dutch words, much more understandable based on what they do, is you might see semaphore weight or P referred to as down, and semaphore post or B referred to as up. Because what semaphore weight will do is atomically subtract one from the value, so atomically decrement 
value, and then it will block if after it subtracts one from the value, the current value is negative. Our post up atomically increments the value And if there are any threads that are currently waiting, it will wait one of them up. So one way that we can use this semaphore is if we give it a value of 1, it becomes our mutual exclusion lock. You would call wait. To acquire the lock, and that would decrement the value from 1 to 0. And then any other threads that try to wait on the semaphore uh, in the meantime would cause this value to go negative. And then every time a thread called post released this lock, it would wake up one of the ones that were waiting. And then once the value got back up to 1, after all threads who were waiting had gotten a chance to run and then released it, the lock would again be free. Okay. Is there like a maximum value or some way of like preventing a thread from going send post, send post, send post, send post? Um, that's interesting. Uh, yeah, so I think for this to work, uh, the value can never go above its initial value. Because the entire idea is that we initialize the semaphore to say, okay, let so many threads call wait before any more have to block. Uh, and so if you are able to raise the value above that, then you're sort of undermining this constraint that the semaphore is saying that only a certain number of threads get get to have a turn of time. Oh. So does that end? Is it like every time you call wait, you have to call post, and for every call of post, there has to be a previous call of wait, like for a lock? Or is it, can you do some things where it's like, you wait at one part of the code, and then maybe somewhere later you post for some reason, it might, or does it have to be like, wait post as like a chunk? Yeah, so this is uh, a great uh, a great point that this, uh, design is far more flexible than the lock and the condition variable, uh, uh, condition variables that we've seen so far, and that you could design some complicated scheme where you're kind of sending signals from one part of the code to the other by decrementing or incrementing the semaphore. Uh, and that's sort of the, 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 the benefit and the downside to this design is that it's a fair bit more complex than just acquiring or releasing a lock or waiting on a condition variable. Because there's many more different situations that can arise when you have this value that can, can be in a range of states. How is this better, any better than just a lock in a state? I mean, it just seems like it's automatically made a whole bunch of decisions about the lock in state for you that now make it so that you can't have customized, I mean, you can customize it, you just have to use their tool now for it. Is it more efficient or anything, or is it just like bundled into one? Uh, yes. So, is this any better than uh, a lock and a state? Uh, usually, no. That. The trade-off of we have this thing that's a, that's a lot more complex that we can get into a lot of trouble if we try to use it for some complicated design. Uh, 
we usually rather rely on simpler concurrency primitives. Not everyone shares the view. Dijkstra certainly thought these were great. It's like a, it's a, it's one thing that can do a lot, or condition variable, or something even different. And so maybe like, well, it's, it's powerful, and that's why we want it. But uh, it is. A, uh, a difficult tool to use due to this complexity. Uh, and so uh, you, because it kind of has two different abstractions kind of in one, uh, we have uh, kind of uh, mutual, we can do mutual exclusion with it. We can also do a kind of condition variable thing with it because it's a way for, for threads to wait for some other event to occur. And you kind of have to carefully map whatever state of the application you're dealing with onto the state of the semaphore. And it can be done, but uh, it is often difficult. That said, there is one situation where semaphores are actually commonly used. Um, And that is in an interrupt handler uh, for some uh, input output with a hardware device. So We're typically not going to be able to coordinate the behavior of, say, the operating system kernel and some hardware uh, that kind of has some embedded program. Uh, that hardware program's likely not going to be able to interact with a, a lock that's implemented uh, in the kernel code. So if we can't coordinate between, uh, uh, we can't use this lock. Uh, should the interrupt handler uh, just signal a thread waiting for this I.O. using a condition variable and no lock. Uh, this exposes you to an edge case where uh, the thread checks, is this I.O. finished? But then before, and says, oh, there's no I.O. For, for me to do, I should go to sleep. But then before it goes to sleep, the interrupt handler runs, sends a signal, and now, because the thread isn't, isn't yet asleep, it doesn't receive the signal, the signal is totally lost. But because our semaphore maintains a value, maintains this state, it can't lose that signal. If something calls post, there's a record of the value having been increased by one, kind of no matter the order that stuff happens in. So, Uh, the state of the semaphore avoids a potential loss signal in the specific context of this interrupt handler. So that's uh, the one situation where, in practice, you would often see a semaphore use. Uh, why is like a lock different than a semaphore in this situation? Like, why can't a semaphore go to a hardware software but a lock can't? Uh, so the issue is that the hardware code is going to uh, uh, signal the interrupt handler and or, or, or send a signal that invokes the interrupt handler. And the, the question is the uh, can the interrupt handler uh, like the the hardware before it sends before it sends a signal to start the interrupt handler, it has no way to acquire a lock or fail to acquire a lock and wait for some thread to be ready to receive the signal. So now we're in the interrupt handler and 
we don't really want the interrupt handler to ever block. Okay, if at all possible, blocking in the middle of an interrupt, uh, suspending the in the middle of an interrupt, we, we, we want to avoid as much as possible. Uh, and so we don't want the interrupt handler to have to wait for a lock to try and coordinate with the thread it's waking up. And so we could just have it signal a condition variable, but then we risk losing that update. And so instead, we'll have it call post on a semaphore, and then eventually the thread that's waiting will will be able to check that semaphore to see is there uh, uh, is there I/O from this device for for me to process now. So, so in this case, uh, the hardware just like knows where the semaphore state is being stored. And it can go check if there's something that's like trying to do I/O. Yeah. So, so the hardware itself is not interacting with the semaphore. Okay. The issue is that if we could, what we'd like is before the hardware sends this signal to start the interrupt, that the hardware would acquire a lock, so that either it knows no one else is going to check for this in the middle of this. Uh, signaling process, or force the hardware to wait until someone else is ready. Hardware can't do that. So hardware is just going to start our interrupt handler when it wants to, and without some coordination with the thread that's kind of waiting. And so now we're faced with the question: Okay, in the interrupt handler, what can we do to communicate to the thread that the I/O is ready? in a way that guarantees the thread will eventually see that information. Other questions? All right. Let's take a brief side tour from Lux to talk about 17th president, Andrew Johnson. Uh, you, you may have heard of him. Uh, he was, when Lincoln ran for re-election, uh, he wanted to uh, present a kind of a unified ticket, so he picked someone from the other party, Andrew Johnson, who he appointed military governor of, of Tennessee. Uh, and then when Lincoln died, uh, Andrew Johnson became president. Um, uh, when Lincoln was assassinated, and uh, Andrew Johnson uh, was really not on the same page as uh, the party in control of Congress, the Republicans, about giving rights to uh, 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 free people, uh, free slaves in the South, and so he vetoed a bunch of, of bills. Uh, the Republican Congress impeached him and narrowly uh, failed to remove him from office. Uh, uh, and he uh, tried his hardest to kind of get rid of uh, the, um, the the Secretary of, uh, of War, and so he is he is widely considered one of the worst presidents uh, in U.S. history. Uh, this is a complete mess of of, an, of administration, and uh, uh, really setting up a lot of a lot of conflict uh, that would that would plague the, the country in the, the coming decades. And uh, here's a, a political cartoon uh, from when he uh, was leaving office. Uh, he's, he's kind of dressed as a as, as a king. Presidents who like follow with Congress and veto things were often kind of portrayed as trying to be monarchs um, uh, in, in these days. Uh, so not not uh, not someone who is who is fondly remembered. All right. So. When we've been talking about locks, they're really helpful when the lock is usually free. Meaning that most of the time we try to acquire the lock, we can get it. Sometimes there's someone else who has it, so we might have to wait for a bit. But typically, 
there's not a lot of time spent waiting for the lock to be acquired. And so, if this is the case, our standard mutual exclusion lock works just fine. But we might consider, as is often the case in an OS kernel, we have some data structure that lots of threads read, but relatively few threads ever need to change or, or update. This occurs a lot in databases as, as well. You have lots of uh, uh, reads of information from the database, but maybe only occasionally do you actually need to, to change something. So, in our typical law, uh, in the case where we have lots of readers and occasional writers, well, we can't, our critical section is like any access to this shared data because we can have one thread in there reading while another one writes. But if we have tons of readers, it would actually be fine to have a bunch of threads reading. We've talked about how read only data. That doesn't require synchronization. Uh, and if we have tons of readers and we force them to only kind of read one at a time, we've really limited kind of how how many reads we can do per second if we say kind of only one thread can be reading at a time. And so we really like to uh, have a kind of lock that will distinguish between uh, readers and writers. What? Why do the readers need to get locked? So, uh, why uh, why do our readers need to get? Uh, uh, so, the what we want to do is turn on. I'm going to turn off the light. Uh, so what we'd like to do is to make sure uh, when a thread is writing, no one else, uh, uh, no other thread is reading or writing. That when we're updating the structure, no one else uh, uh, is doing anything. It's this way we pre prevent kind of concurrency bugs. But if there isn't anyone writing, There's no writer. We want to allow any number of readers. This is the goal of uh, what we'll call uh, a, re a reader writer lock. So a lock that distinguishes between uh, I'm acquiring the lock as a reader versus I'm acquiring the lock as a writer. So if we want to uh, what is the state that we're going to have to keep track of in this reader-writer lock? Uh, we need to keep track of the kind of number of active readers, uh, the number of active writers, so that we know is there someone currently writing uh, uh, or not. And we might want to keep track of the number of waiting readers and the number of waiting writers. And I keep track of all threads that have tried to acquire or currently hold this block in item mode. Uh, and uh, anyone recall from the, yeah, um, why do we need to keep track of how many readers we have when we just going to let everyone read? Uh, an excellent question. We will we will see shortly, um, and you'll you'll have a chance to discuss kind of when we might need that information. Yeah. And then also, like, why is the active writer plural? Because uh, are we only supposed to have one thing that's writing? Uh, it's 
plural just to be consistent with these other variables. Oh, well, uh, but this only supposed to store one right? Yes. The idea is that you either have to zero or one active writer. Uh, does anyone remember from the, the notes or the reading if we have a situation where uh, some threads are uh, producing data or writing data and, and other threads are consuming or reading that data, uh, what uh, sort of synchronization uh, variables were, were used to accomplish that? Yeah, what do you say? Two, what they want for their producer and one for their consumer. Uh, uh, two, two what? Two uh, condition variables. Yeah, that we, exactly. We would want uh, a way for uh, a condition variable that we'll use for like readers to wait to until they can uh, proceed and a separate one. Where uh, writers will wait until they can they can go, and we'll also need uh, a lock that we'll use to protect uh, these these conditions. Uh, so we're going to have four uh, uh, four functions here. We're going to uh, have a thread that is. Uh, uh, wants to start it wants to start a read a thread that wants to start a write and a thread that is done reading and a thread that is done writing these are basically we have an acquire and release of this lock for the for if you're reading Versus if you're writing. So for each of these uh, methods, we will uh, start. Uh, we will hold our our uh, <coughs> mutex for the method to kind of make each of these for a, a topic. So this is one way that I. Encourage you to think about using the locks uh, in the OSV labs as well. As thinking about okay, which set of operations need to be atomic, need to happen all at once, which set of things should not be interrupted. Uh, for example, uh, uh, some people have have had bugs where a lock was not held during the steps and exit that are cleaning up a thread. Which means that you could partially clean up a thread and then switch to some other thread. And now you have a thread that's sort of partially cleaned up and you try and run that process again, uh, bad things may happen. Uh, think in terms of which sets of, of operations need to be atomic, you don't want them to be to be halfway done. Anyway, we're going to acquire uh, uh, the mutex at the start of each of these and release it. at the end. And so when we are uh, starting a read, the first thing we'll do is say, OK, I'm going to start out assuming that I'm going to have to wait. And, that, and only after that will I check, like, do I actually need to wait? Can I start reading? And so I'm going to defer the logic of when a reader should wait to another method, another function, uh, reader should wait. Uh, but while a, re a reader should wait, uh, we'll just have that reader wait on the reader condition variable. If we're ever done reading uh, and the reader shouldn't wait anymore, and say, okay, well, I'm not a waiting reader anymore, I'm an active reader. And that is kind of, I've now updated the state of my 
reader writer lock to reflect that there is another reader that has successfully uh, started it. And uh, when we are uh, starting a uh, starting a, uh, a write, that will be fairly similar. We need to acquire the lock. Say that we are. A, uh, a waiting writer. And then while uh, a writer should wait in the current state, we'll wait on the uh, condition variable for the writers. And just need to change these two to be the writers. So, uh, does this make sense so far? Any questions on how we kind of acquire this lock as a reader or writer? All right, so now it is uh, your turn uh, to work with your neighbors to figure out what, what are the conditions, like what about our, the state of our reader writer lock means that a reader should wait versus when a writer should wait. Uh, and we, we want to fill in we want to fill in what these uh, two functions should return. Uh, and the other thing I will say we want to prefer writers. Meaning that uh, if a writer wants to acquire the lock, it should get the opportunity to do so at the earliest possible point. Basically that waiting writers should get priority over waiting readers. So you're looking for some Boolean expression involving the state of the lock that indicates whether a reader should wait and whether a writer should wait. So go ahead and uh, work on that with your neighbors. Is the only wait this other way? All right. So let's, uh, let's talk about when these when these things should wait. Uh, uh, when uh, suggestion for for when our our reader should uh, should not proceed. Carol? When uh, waiting the writers is not equal to zero. Yeah, if there is any waiting writers. Uh, is there another situation where we don't want someone reading, Elliot? Or if that's an active writer? Yeah, if there's anyone, if there's a writer waiting, we're going to let them go first. If there's someone currently writing, we can't read because uh, the, the data structure is uh, in the midst of being uh, in the midst of being on the So readers will wait for writers, whether active or, or waiting. Um, does that make sense? Any questions on that? How about the, the writer's side of things? When, when does our, our writer need to wait? Okay. There's an active writer. Yeah, we only want one uh, active writer in there at a time. Uh, so we're, we're not going to let a second one in uh, until the first one is finished. Uh, any other criteria that we should prevent a, a writer? Also active readers? Yeah, if there's anyone actively doing stuff with the data structure, uh, the writer shouldn't be in there modifying in the middle of that. So a writer will wait for any current readers to finish, but any waiting readers will give way to waiting writers. So this is the, the idea that writers are preferred in this scenario. Doesn't have to be designed that way, uh, but one one goal that you could have. Uh, uh, if our assumption of there being few writers turns out to be wrong, or is wrong some of the time, uh, anyone foresee a, an issue with our with our design? Uh, readers would never get to read. 
Yeah, readers uh, uh, enter what is referred to as starvation. They just never get to run. Uh, if, and so this reader-writer really sort of operates on the idea that rights aren't very common. Because if there's lots of rights, then may, like this whole point of trying to allow a bunch of reads that runs kind of becomes less, less relevant. Any questions on that? Do we have a good solution for when there are lots of writers? Yes. So uh, if there if there are lots of writers, and uh, we so there are basically kind of two routes you can go if you have like a right dominated workload. Um, you can. Uh, you can either say, okay, everything's going to be completely consistent, one right at a time. Maybe that's a performance bottleneck, but it's worth it to keep everything consistent. Or what is more common is it's really like we don't want to take the, the, the performance hit to make things totally consistent. And so writers will uh, actually kind of write to separate copies of the data, and there'll be some protocol for kind of eventually making these consistent. And the cost is that readers will sometimes see out-of-date information. And so it depends on your situation. If, like, the, if what you're uh, determining is like the order of, say, Google search results, maybe it's OK that sometimes someone gets a slightly different order because the data is a little out-of-date. And if it's super fast, there's a little bit of inconsistency. Who cares? Uh, if it's uh, the amount of money in your bank account, mm -hmm. you're like, you know, I'd really like there not to be some ambiguity and like delay and it just says the wrong thing for a while. Oh, it'll eventually be correct. No, that's just not acceptable. So it depends on the situation. Other questions? All right, so yeah. Why is it that you can like refresh a page and the number of views you see goes down instead of up? Yeah, so this is uh, getting into more of a distributed systems kind of question. Uh, and I don't know exactly what YouTube is, is doing, but one possibility is that every time you load the page, you are sending a request to some network server. But the data for the page is uh, replicated across many different servers, split across many different servers. So you might actually end up getting information from a different server than the one you talked to originally. Like maybe some, some uh, uh, computer in a rack and some data center failed, and you're talking to a different one than the one you did before. Or you're just, whichever one you connect to first, or there's some load balancing, you're directed to a different endpoint than, than before. So, yeah, and, and in this case, really not important that YouTube be like much slower in order for the view number to be super consistent. Yeah, who cares? <laughs> Other questions? All right, so uh, there are a couple other uh, kinds of locks uh, in the notes for today. Um, I only have time to talk about one of them. So there's a, uh, uh, the situation that I'm not going to talk about is what if we have tons of threads all trying to acquire a lock at the same time? This can create a, a performance bottleneck if Threads on different processors are trying to acquire the same lock. Uh, and if you're curious about that, uh, look at the, the, the notes. The situation that I want to finish on is uh, what if we have, um, uh, again, what if we have a, uh, a ton of readers? Uh, the same situation with the reader writer lock. But 
uh, maybe uh, a just incredible disparity between the number of reads and the number of writes, and just a huge number of reads we want to do every second. So we want to We want to maximize read performance over and above what we did with the reader writer lock. Because the reader writer lock helped a great deal, allowing us to have multiple reads at once. But here we're saying, look, I don't care how slow writes get, there's almost never a write. I need blazingly fast read performance. To the point where we have Like maybe we have hundreds of thousands of reads every second. Uh, and with that many reads, even if the reads have, uh, and these reads are, with this many per second, these reads are probably pretty short. Like the, the critical section that our reader writer lock is protecting, pretty short. Uh, and what was, what was the first thing that our, uh, our start read method did? Part of the lock, right? Yeah, so our our start read method, only one thread could be in there at a time. And so acquiring a lock to start our read. That can become a huge bottleneck when we have tons and tons of reads. You might think of it, we have like all these reads, but the kind of they have to all pass through this one read at a time, gets the lock, starts the read, and then releases the lock. And so, because we're only kind of allowing one thread at a time to sort of enter into reading mode, we have this big bottleneck uh, uh, when we're using the reader writer lock. So, like I, uh, like we were just uh, discussing, our solution is uh, it's okay if some threads see old data, if it lets us get much better performance, if it lets us remove this bottleneck. So our idea here is a read, copy, update approach, or RCU. So uh, a lock using this approach would be called an RCU lock. Uh, and the way this works is I have time here, uh, left to right, and so we have some some read. It's going to be reading the old kind of the old version of the data. We have some read here, also reading our old version, and then while these are are reading, another thread. Makes a change to to the uh, to the data. It publishes some some new data. And so what this thread did was is it, when it started, it made a copy of the data. It then made its changes to the copy, kind of read and copy. And then it atomically updated 
the data from the old version to the new version, which you can think about just atomically changing the pointer. Changing a pointer from pointing to the old data to pointing to the new data. And so kind of at this point, the update is published, kind of made available. And if we had if we had a couple threads that were reading, and it had started reading before this update was published, then depending on like when they go get the pointer to this data structure. They might read the old value if they did it right at the start, or they might read the new, the, the new data. But importantly, they will read either the entire old data structure or the entire new one. They'll never get kind of a, they'll never get one that's a mix of the two. So they'll always see something consistent. It may just be the old the old data. And then any read. that starts after the update is published, we'll always see the new data. So if we're making all these copies of this data, it would probably be bad if we just let thousands of copies build up over time. Probably want to you know, clean them up, garbage collect them. Uh, when would it be safe to Get rid of the old data uh, in this in this picture. Right. As soon as all the old reads are done. Exactly. But as whenever we publish the update, all the currently running threads, they might need they might need to read the old data. They may be currently reading the old data, and so as soon as the kind of the last thread that could have seen the old data finishes. That's the point. Uh, once this thread finishes, the last one that could be reading the old data, that's when we can garbage collect, throw away, uh, free up the memory for the old data. Well, is there an efficient variant of this in a situation where your data is large enough that you want to copy it for every thread? Uh, so, uh, the, you could uh, partition the data. And if you're making an update to kind of just one partition, that's the part that you copy. Okay. Um, and then it would, you would need some way of linking these partitions together, and you would atomically update some part of that uh, that link. And it, basically, uh, a common strategy: if the data is say too big to fit in memory, you would copy it chunk by chunk using the disk. Uh, as kind of, you copy a chunk, you update it, you put it on the disk, copy a chunk, update it, put it on the disk, and eventually you kind of updated all the chunks, and then you would change, uh, change the pointer. So, um, yeah, strategies for dealing with absolutely massive data usually involve breaking it up, and maybe some of it lives on the disk, or some of it lives on other machines. Um, but this, this read, copy, update, Importantly, we'll let our reads start without acquiring a lock. Our writes are slow because they do all this copying and they have to keep track of like when the last read finishes. But the reads are super fast, no lock. They just go right in and start reading. All right, so that's all we have time for today uh, on uh, how else our uh, lab hours tomorrow night. And I will see you on Friday. I put them bound my sister. Nobody knows just how it started. Somebody blew it through.